Today, we're going to be talking about exploring memory through sculpture. So how do artists adapt and transform their memories into different types of sculpture? How does sculpture act as a medium for transforming these types of memories? Um, and we're gonna look at this in a few different ways. We're gonna look at two pieces today um, to kind of think about that topic. So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Natalie. Um, I'm a senior here at Stanford. Um, I'm a major in American studies and my concentration is in race, gender and sexuality in American art. Um, what that means is that I've been able to take a lot of classes about different facets of American art specifically. So I've taken classes like censorship in American art, um, migration and diaspora, Asian American art, African American art. Um, and I've also taken some co coursework in the, um, in the gender area. Um, as well as in um, comparative studies in race and ethnicity. Um, I'm also a tour guide here at the Cantor in Anderson, which has been a wonderful experience. Um, one of the best things I think I've done at Stanford, um, learning about how to show art, learning more about how to study art. Um, and uh, I was trained virtually over Zoom. So this year has been super exciting to actually be in the museums and give tours. It's been definitely one of the highlights of my year. Um, so. At Stanford, there's two museums. There's the Cantor, um, which has a really wide range of art, anything from like ancient art to modern day. Um, it's a huge museum, you know, lots of different wings. Um, if you haven't been before, which I'm sure many of the people on the Zoom have been to the Cantor, um, I highly recommend. Um, I've had so many great classes there and um, it really lets you study the art um, in close proximity, which has been uh, really great. And it's just a fantastic institution that. I think we're so lucky to have on campus. Um, but today we're gonna be talking about the Anderson Collection. So the Anderson Collection has art from post-World War II, so modern and contemporary art, and they have paintings, drawings, sculptures. Um, it's a really beautiful space. It's located right next to the Cantor, in case any of you are interested. It's a beautiful building and full of a lot of amazing art. Um, so if you were to go into the Anderson, which obviously we're not there today, um, this is what it would look like. Um, like I said, it's a really beautiful space. Um, the Andersons who donated the art to this collection um, originally uh, had the art displayed in their home. So the gallery really has like a very intimate feel to it. Um, very light, um, lots of like little spaces that you can see the art in. Um, and I think that gives it a really great feel and it's a really a special museum because of that. Um, so we're gonna get started looking at the art. So um, what I want everyone to do is just take a minute or two to look at this piece. Um, I would love for everyone to drop any observations they have about this piece into the chat. Um, this could be anything from just what initially strikes you about it to, um, you know, if you think something about the color, or about the shapes, um, literally anything that uh, you could possibly think, just put it in the chat and I'll read out some of them. So, okay, so someone said it reminds them of streets. Um, someone else said it looks like an elevator. I love that. I totally get the elevator comparison, like this box with different things in it, you know, it looks like it could bring you up like a machine. Yeah, definitely with all the different parts, um, like lots of different kind of mechanical looking things. Um, yeah, totally. Um, I think this sculpture has a lot going on. So all of these interpretations are totally valid. Um, yeah. Oh, great observation. So it seems like a piece of furniture designed by a cubist. So I love that kind of bringing in some other art. So this cubism, kind of this breaking up of shapes, all these different shapes, um, and like a piece of furniture. So maybe like a cabinet or something you would see in someone's house to hold something. Definitely. Yeah, I definitely, someone says it's a little scary. Yeah, definitely. Looks like weapons. Yeah, lots of sharp edges in this one. Um, like, you know, lots of kind of scary industrial looking things. Um, and I also think adding to the scariness is the color. Like if you see it in person, it's all black, um, just all one color. It's uh, covered by enamel. Um, so great. Oh my God, these are such great observations. Oh, tool cabinet, definitely. Um, you kind of get the, the cabinetry with the open doors and then all of these different things stuck inside. Yeah, definitely. All of these are super valid and um, 
I love hearing the observations. Thank you all for participating. Um, so I'll give you, I'll, I'm gonna zoom in to the piece a little bit. So I'm sorry these in, images aren't the highest resolution, but um, these are a few things that sometimes people point out on my tours about this piece. Um, on the left, there's this kind of like banister looking thing. Um, and a lot of people give like very different interpretations of what they think it is. Um, some people have said like, oh, it reminds them of a crib or it reminds them of a staircase, something like that. And then on the right, we have um, kind of like this wrench looking like riveted type of object. Um, anyways, these are just two of the pieces that often catch people's eyes on the tour. Um, and like we said, like we were saying before, like everyone thinks the sculpture looks a little differently and all of the interpretations are super valid. So I'm going to give you a little context. Oh, sorry. This is two other angles of the sculpture. Obviously we're not in the Anderson, so we can't see it from all angles, but this is just to kind of show you, um, some different perspectives on it. So I'm going to give you a little context about this piece. So this is a piece um, that was made by Louise Nevelson. It's called Sky Garden. It's enamel on wood. So when you see the sculpture in person, it's pretty enormous. Um, it's definitely way taller than me. Um, and it's big, wooden, bulky, um, you know, all of these different pieces like we were talking about before. Um, and yeah, it's called Sky Garden. Um, if you ever see a Louise Nevelson piece, she's really known for these big wooden sculptures that are all one color. So if you ever go into a museum and you see like a giant wooden sculpture and it's all one color, you'll know it's a Louise Nevelson. So that's a little bit of education. So you can go and impress people in a museum by pointing out that it's a Nevelson. So I'll give you a little bit of biographical information about Louise Nevelson. So she was born in Kiev, Ukraine, and moved to New York City to continue her art practice. So she immigrated here. Um, and she is very well known for uh, different types of sculptures, uh, working with different pieces. Um, so Louise Nevelson, uh, this piece is something called an assemblage. So an assemblage is a piece of art in which artists take um, already made objects and they put them together into one piece. So sometimes people call it like 3D collage. Um, and Louise Nevelson uses wood, but there are all kinds of crazy assemblages. Like Robert Rauschenberg, who's um, another really famous assemblage artist, um, he puts like taxidermied animals and like all sorts of crazy like plastic things into his assemblages. Um, and the amazing thing about assemblage, in my opinion, is that it brings all of these disparate pieces into one whole. So for example, if we saw, you know, one of these boxes of Louise Nevelson's work, it would look very different than um, the other pieces. Um, bringing them together gives it an entirely new dimension. And it puts these things together in a way that makes us think maybe it's an elevator, maybe it's a toolbox, maybe it's something, something else. Um, so another interesting biographical piece of information about Louise Nevelson is that her father was a wood carver. So she grew up around wood, around people working with wood, just all throughout her life. And when I think about this sculpture, I think a lot about memory and how we think about our memories and how we preserve them. Um, a lot of people, I think one person in this Zoom said uh, it reminds them of like a cabinet. And when I think about cabinets, I think about how they're really personal and they're something that we store objects in. They're something that we design for ourselves. Um, some people on my tours have expressed, you know, my cabinet, I like it just the way I have it. Um, and I arrange it in the way that best functions me. Um, but a lot of the time we store objects in our cabinet and objects are the way we remember memory. So when I look at this, I think about all the different things that someone could be trying to remember by putting them in this cabinet. You know, maybe that banister was part of someone's home. Maybe that wrench was something that someone's dad used. Um, and how we think about remembering all of these things. And I think knowing that Louise Nevelson's dad was a wood carver kind of gives a different dimension to this piece. I think, you know, maybe it's trying to memorialize something. Maybe it's trying to put that into a memory, to put all these disparate things together in kind of a desperate attempt to remember the different parts of our lives. Um, and even the name of the piece, Sky Garden, I think about, you know, the heavens or something above us. Um, so like, how do we remember 
people and things after they're gone. Um, so I think that's the beautiful thing about assemblage is that it can put together so many different things that bring a new dimension to what we're looking at. And I think Louise Nevelson is really trying to transform memory into something that we can see and something that we can observe um, into a new way. So um, let's keep thinking about those ideas of memory um, and transformation as we move through the Anderson to our next piece. So if we were in the museum, we would be moving through and uh, kind of moving to a different part of the gallery. Um, so let's move on to our next piece. So again, um, just take a minute, um, observe, put any observations you have about this piece in the chat, um, anything about color or shape or anything like that. Oh, and um, feel free to save, I'll answer questions at the end. So feel free to just save your questions and I'll make sure to do a Q&A at the end. Oh, okay, great one. Someone said rebellious act to marble. Okay, I love that. If you want, you can put in some more in the chat. Like what about this reads rebellious to you? Um, and good observation, it is marble. Um, smooth shape of a woman. Yeah, definitely. If you see this piece in person, um, it's like very striking just how smooth and kind of perfect the marble is. It's like so polished, um, it like glistens, it shines, it's it's like perfection. But yeah, and you see like a woman, so we see like this face. Um, yeah, the color seems not traditional, definitely. So we've talked about the color seems rebellious. Like usually when you see marble in general, like I'm thinking of marble floors or marble counters, um, you like don't have color on them. Like it's just showing off, you know, kind of the, the shape, the, the intricacies of the texture of the marble. Um, and yes, so the red, the, the pink, it's actually a pink and blue um, that is applied to the marble. So that's not the lighting. Um, there's paint on top of the marble. Um, so I know that can kind of get lost in the in the virtual setting. But yeah, very wide lips. We have these features. Cocooned in sleep, that's a great observation. Kind of like this, what I hear when you say cocooned in sleep is kind of this peacefulness, this kind of serenity to this figure. Yeah, definitely. That's all good impressions. Um, I'm going to zoom in on this piece a little bit so you can see kind of the texture of this paint. Um, so as you can see, the paint is, you know, um, people have said haphazard. It's kind of like stroked on there. You can see there's lots of little flecks of paint. Um, and it definitely has kind of a textural aspect to it um, on top of the marble. Oh yeah, goddess vibes. Definitely, I feel that like very um, elegant, you know, kind of otherworldly uh, aspect to this figure. But yeah, so the paint is definitely a very striking aspect to this piece. And I think it's one of the things that people notice um, first about, about this piece. Okay, so I'll give you a little context about this piece. So this piece is by a sculptor named Manuel Neri, um, and he is part of the Bay Area Figurative Movement. So the Bay Area Figurative Movement is a group of sculptors from the Bay Area who, after the modern movement towards abstraction, so um, think about kind of like Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko, um, who are all these painters in New York, um, this group of painters in the Bay Area, they decide to start putting figuration, so like in the most uh, basic sense, like people back into their sculptures. So you can kind of see in these two pictures of Manuel Neri, um, he's kind of carving these sculptures. This is him working in plaster. He makes these amazing sculptures with these figures kind of emerging out of the plaster. And the Anderson also has um, a plaster a piece of his. Um, so going back to this, uh, we can see the most striking aspect of this piece is the uh, is the uh, paint on this piece. Um, and Manuel Neri um, actually traveled to Carrara, Italy to study there with kind of like some masters and learn about classical sculpture. So um, many of you have probably seen classical sculpture before. It's, you know, in tons of museums. I think about the Metropolitan Museum of Art has like 
hundreds of these sculptures, like an entire hall full of them. Um, on the right, we have the David, which is probably one of the most famous sculptures of all time by Michelangelo. Um, and uh, these sculptures are made out of this beautiful polished marble. Um, they have a lot of perfection to them. Um, you know, I think when people think about classical sculptures and antiquity, a lot of the time they think of like, you know, them being like one of the greatest sculptures of all time, the most perfect, the most, you know, venerated human forms. Um, so Neri was studying all of these sculptures and he, he was learning from the masters. Um, but when you think about these sculptures and we think about the Makita piece, um, we see some differences. We see that the Neri piece has this paint on it, like this maybe like people would think it's kind of an abomination to put paint on like such perfect marble like this. Um, but what Manuel Neri would say back to that is that he's actually working in the tradition of the classical sculpture. So when we see these classical sculptures today, they're white, they're perfectly polished. Um, you know, they have no color on them whatsoever. But in actuality, in antiquity, these sculptures were all painted in very vibrant colors, in very um, realistic colors. Um, and uh, Neri knew this and he was studying this in Italy. So he was thinking about how do I actually take this tradition and continue it? How do I bring this kind of like original painting back into sculpture? Um, and that was what one thing that Neri says about his own sculptures is that um, he um, is continuing in that tradition. Um, another thing I will bring up about the Neri piece and about the paint on this piece is when we think about making a sculpture that takes from a tradition, that takes from the memory of classical sculpture, um, we think about how does an artist take that and make it their own? How do they transform that memory of sculptures that have already been made into their own? And what Neri does is he puts this paint on his sculpture. He, on many of his sculptures, he has this kind of like splashing, splotching of paint. And when we look at a Neri sculpture, we can see the hand of the artist on that sculpture. We can see that it's, you know, distinctly a Neri piece um, and that he's making it his own and that he's transforming it. And when I think about, you know, modern and contemporary artists, I think a lot of the time there's this question of originality and authenticity. How do I make art that's unique when there's so much art that's already been made before? If Manuel Neri was just to make a marble sculpture without this paint on it, it would fit perfectly into, you know, the Metropolitan Museum's classical sculpture exhibit. But Manuel Neri doesn't want to be a part of that exhibit. He wants to make his art unique and individual and authentic. And one of the ways you can do that is by creating divergences in your own sculptural practice and what's been done before. And maybe that's as simple as just putting paint onto marble. It makes it a signature. It shows that it's an original Neri piece um, and all of those things. So while many people can see the paint as, you know, taking away from the marble, I really see it as adding into this new tradition of you know, making sculpture unique, making it original, bringing it into the 20th and 21st centuries with new traditions. And when we're thinking about Manuel Neri and Luis Nevelson, we're thinking about this kind of adaptation of memory. So Luis Nevelson is thinking about memory. She was thinking about memory um, by transforming it into this series of objects, into this cabinet where lots of things are stored. And when Manuel Neri was thinking about transforming memory. He's thinking about how do I transform this memory of how sculpture was made into a memory of how sculpture can be made now. Um, and I think that's the amazing thing about sculptural practice is that it allows you to make an object that allows for adaptation and transformation in so many different ways. And I think both of these sculptors have done that in a very profound way. Um, and I think we can see the connections in the different ways that they handle their material, their subject matter, and their history. So that's my presentation for today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I'll do my best to answer them. But again, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, this is the first virtual tour I've done in like over a year. So I'm really happy um, that I get the opportunity to speak to all of you.
Um, somebody did say a question earlier, um, which I'll answer now, which was, is the assemblage of Luis Nevelson one object or is it a stack of several? Um, I guess that's an interesting question because the pieces are all um, bound together, like they're glued together. So it does present as one object, but it is a bunch of like individual objects. So it's like crates and um, wrenches and like wooden things. It is like a stack of several objects, but they're glued together in one. So I hope that answers the, the question. Um, if, if you want more clarification, I can do my best to answer it. Uh, the Nuri head is a, a more than life size. It's um, the question is, is the Nuri head um, life size? Um, it's bigger. It's um, God, I'm so bad at like size comparisons, but it's like three times the size of the like a human head. Like it's it's big um, and it's definitely like a big giant block of marble. Um, if, it, if it was to be on a human body, it would be on like an eight foot tall person. Um, how did I connect these two works in particular? Um, that's a good question. I will say that I was first, I, I really enjoy sculpture in general. Um, like I would say, I'm always really drawn to it. And in the Anderson in particular, I think there's so many interesting sculptures that I like studied and was drawn to. And I think um, when I learned about these two artists, I kind of saw like a lot of connections, I guess, in their practices and how they talked about their art actually. Um, Cause I read some interviews um, from each artist um, and that kind of just made me see like some connections between the two. Um, but I guess that was kind of interesting reading. There's a lot of great stuff written about um, Neri. There's a book at the Anderson that's really, really well-written. Um, and Louise Nevelson has given some interviews. So I think those were two of the places I saw connection. Um, yeah, so someone said the Nuri head seems really internally focused, not looking out at the world, no eyes. Yeah, I think that's a great observation. I think the lack of eyes definitely makes you feel like maybe the figure has more like internal peace, things like that. But yeah, it's a great observation. Okay, I think, I think if that's it. So there's another art break next month. Um, coming up in June. If you use the same link, you can register for that one. Um, I hope you enjoyed um, this one, and I hope you'll keep attending the art breaks uh, from the Anderson and the Cantor. Um, we as student guides love giving them, so yeah. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, this was a great experience, and I hope you all have a great day.